Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the audience, for everyone who has joined. Um, to start with, um, Dr. Frida Mowo, together with Dr. Egina Makwabe, will be moderating the session. Just to remind some few of our, of our house rules, please remember to mute your mic, especially when the presenter is presenting. And also you can write questions or comments in the chat. And after the presentation, we'll be asking those questions. And if you want to talk after the end of the presentation, you can raise your hand so that we can invite you to talk. So today we are excited to have our audience uh, on every Thursday of the week for fireside chats of nephrology from Africa Healthcare Network. We are discussing different topics from different various renowned speakers all around the world. Our today's speaker will be all the way from Toronto, Canada. He is a teacher and clinician, as well as a researcher. He is assistant professor, Department of Medicine in University of Toronto. He is also staff nephrologist in University Health of Toronto. He has a vast experience in different aspects of nephrology, peritoneal dialysis, transplantation, and clinical nephrology and with several achievements in both academic and clinical aspects of nephrology. Today, he will be going to talk about how to deal with hyperkalemia. Therefore, we are excited and we would like to welcome Dr. Tusha Malavey, all the way from Toronto, Canada. You are welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Framoa, Dr. Vincent, and all of you guys, my colleagues here. I am so excited to present this. Um, uh, I will need your help when I present. Uh, this can be an interactive session. Uh, please feel free. Uh, I know Frida did mention to ask the questions at the last time, but I would like if you want to interrupt me so as to uh, clarify the doubts. I would take a session about potassium, but uh, it's obviously we know what is potassium. We know it, it's a, it will be a good uh, a refresher for many of us to understand and hear from someone else as well. It will probably just be a good revision of the topic, okay? Uh, please let me know which screen you're seeing because I don't want to present a screen in which uh, uh, I'm presenting the not, not, uh, not the presenter's screen, okay? Okay, so uh, we'll be talking about uh, dealing with hyperkalemia and what we will do is uh, we'll talk about uh, this potassium and by the way today is world kidney day so i uh, wish you all about the world kidney day as we have a common theme amongst us taking care of the kidneys of the patients so coming back to potassium so the agenda for today is we'll be doing some cases uh, we'll be doing some physiology causes and evaluation clinical features management and take home message now the topic given to me was dealing with hyperkalemia, but I think if you understand the physiology, the causes and evaluation, the management becomes very easy because management is pretty simple as we know how to do a shifting of the glucose insulin and giving a calcium. So now coming to, a, I'm going to give you three cases which we commonly see and we speak. Now, these three cases are very common and I'm not going to be putting up any very high uh, uh, case, which is like a pseudo hypo aldosteronism or like something very weird presentation, but very common cases. So this is a 60 year old lady who is a end stage renal disease on dialysis and she presents to the emergency feeling unwell. She had missed two sessions of dialysis, which is not uncommon. And then she's alert, blood pressure is really high, saturations of 92% and room air, labs show the creatine of 1400, for those who use the uh, American units, this would be around like 18 to 20. And potassium was 8.5. ER uh, physician calls you, and then you see this ECG, okay? So the next appropriate treatment, uh, this would be either the four options that we have is immediate dialysis or start cake slit, glucose insulin shift, or calcium gluconate IV. Obviously, when you have this kind of a therapy, the answer is pretty obvious, which we'll be we'll discussing in, uh, in a short while. The second case is an outpatient. 
you have a 65 male with a type 2 diabetes mellitus and with a CKD, and the speed is 180, which is uh, equivalent to almost like 2.5 or so, and EGF of 33, and is referred for management of chronic disease. His blood pressure is a bit elevated. You start him on the ramipril 5 milligrams daily, and a recent blood work shows a creatine of 200. So definitely he has got a creatine which is bumped from 180 to 200, and the serum potassium is now 5.5. The blood pressure is still elevated. What would you like to do next? So the options are you start him on a diuretic, the longer acting diuretic nowadays we use is chlorothalidone, or else you give him a glucose insulin shift, or else give a cake slit, or a low potassium diet. Now, I would, the answer would here, uh, we'll come to it later, but understanding that there are two or three things which we need to know is the blood pressure targets for a diabetic. The blood pressure target for a diabetic is less than 130 by 80, as we know. So he's definitely hypertensive in spite of having ramipril. So we need to give him something which will bring his potassium down and the uh, blood pressure down as well. The third is a 54-year-old male patient with HIV who was closely followed by for CD4 pounds. He got admitted for PJP pneumonia and then his CD count, when his CD4 counts were below 100, he started on score trimoxazole. His creatinine increased from 80 to 110. That's basically from almost like 1 to 1.5, 1.3. And his potassium was 6.7. His score trimoxazole was changed due to hyperkalemia and the repeat potassium after four days was 4.5. So we know this is the core trimoxazole, the septra or bacterium, which is known as that, is causing the hyperkalemia. Now the question is, what is that mechanism? Why does the potassium go up when you are on a four time oxazole? Is it because the patient is feeling better and is taking potassium intake? Is it because his kidney has gone worse from 80 to 110? Or is it because there's an increased uptake of potassium from the sodium potassium to chloride co-transporter? Or is it because of the change in the epithelial sodium channel? The answer will come when we are doing the session. So now, as you know, it's potassium. Potassium is something which keeps us on our toes. It wakes up in the night. We do follow the potassium, if, especially if you're not dialyzing the patient, especially if the patient does not have an access for the dialysis. This is something which is like a nightmare for nephrologists. So we will be talking about how to manage a potassium. Going before to that, I'd like to tell you a few things. For the physiology of potassium, one cell to remember in kidney is a principal cell in distal tubule, okay? So this is the cell which puts the potassium out. We have other cells as well, intercalated cells, but the principal cell is the one which puts the potassium out. Just remember P for P, for the principle for potassium. One hormone to remember for potassium is aldosterone, okay? If you have hyperkalemia, that means there is some problem in the axis of aldosterone. Either the patient does not have renin or the patient does not have adrenal gland or the patient does not have aldosterone. If the patient has an aldosterone, there is a normal receptor or the drug is blocking the receptor or if they, everything is fine, but then the channels are not there. Okay, so always remember this, this hormone axis which has to be thought of. If you have a hypokalemia, think of aldosterone. If you have hyperkalemia, think of aldosterone. Remember, aldosterone is made to drive the potassium out of the body and conserve the sodium. So that's why aldosterone is, is always thought of when the patient has high potassium. And the th third thing is, I first used to put only one channel to remember, but now I put two channels to remember, is one is sodium hydrogen antiporter and sodium potassium ATPase, okay? Now, usually it will be the sodium potassium ATPase only, but I put sodium hydrogen antiporter as well because the insulin acts on sodium hydrogen antiporter. And then what it does is when it acts on this channel, it allows the sodium to go inside the cell. Because of the sodium goes inside the cell, then sodium potassium ATPase channel gets activated, the enzyme gets activated, and then potassium is taken in. So the way insulin acts is by is acting on the antiporter, and then you get the action of 
sodium potassium ATPase. So how this is how you remember this. Okay, one cell to remember is principal cell. One hormone to remember is aldosterone, and two channels to remember is sodium potassium, sodium hydrogen antiporter, and sodium uh, potassium ATPase. So now coming to the content of potassium. Now, when Dr. Vincent asked me to do a talk about potassium, the first thing I told him was, Dr. Vincent, please give me something about African diet. So then he got me in touch with the two dietitians and Joan Benson shared with this really helpful. Okay, So this is from the potassium content. And as you know, that 100 milligrams of potassium is almost like 2.56 milligrams. This is from a Kenyan typical diet. So this, I have put up the amount of uh, the name and amount of potassium there and the milligrams it is seen. So as you can see, the highest potassium is in the bug, 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 bug fruit powder part, which is almost 41. Then Jack Jack. I don't know whether I'm saying it correctly or not, but this is what it is. And then we also see that there is a lot of potassium, but the most potassium is there in the uh, in the meat as well. Okay, but I see that lots of uh, uh, pigeon beans uh, peas are used, and pigeon beans also give a lot of potassium as well. There's a rabbit meat as well, which is given. There's a tuna uh, involved as well, and I have seen that uh, some exotic foods, which are caterpillars and termites and lake flies, also have a high potassium in the diet. However, if that was African, this is a typical Western food. Okay, In this, as you can see, the avocado is the first number. A medium-sized avocado gives a whole lot of potassium. I'm very sure that cardiologists must be so happy when they give a patient a high potassium diet with avocado. The rest is, as you can see, is potatoes and then tomatoes. And these are the common culprits, the tomatoes, potatoes, which are very high in potassium. And that's why when you are evaluating a patient with a high potassium and you are trying to evaluate the intake, you ask them how much potatoes are you taking, what way the potato is made, or what, how much tomatoes are you using, or uh, the avocados. If you see the banana that we always say, the banana has a high potassium, but roughly it's one milligrams per inch. And this is a good size banana, by the way, if it is a 12 uh, MEQs, okay? So this is... Uh, uh, roughly understanding how much is a potassium in the diet. Any questions so far? I see that there is uh, glucose insulin shifting. Per, well, uh, yes, that if this answer was for the first question, the first question was calcium. Uh, this fourth one was, yes, this was the fourth. And what is Jack Jack? Jack Jack, Jack was a fruit. Um, so Jack Jack was a fruit. Uh, I can show you, I Googled it out as well. It's one of the fruits which is, uh, I think, in the desert areas, which is very uh, high, le less in water content, but high in potassium content. Well, I don't know, honestly, I Googled out. So uh, if you ask me about potassium, I may be able to tell you, but not about this fruit. <laughs> okay, so now coming to what is potassium shifts and distribution. As we all know that potassium is more in the intracellular. So, uh, as you can see, the intracellular potassium is 140 and extracellular is 4.2. So, this is very essential to understanding how much is the total potassium content. Okay. So, if this is for a male of 70 kgs whose total body water is 42 liters, right, because it's 60%. If you divide that 60% into one thirds and two thirds, so this is 14 and 28 liters. So 28 liters is intracellular and 14 is extracellular. If you multiply the same by the potassium content, if you get four into 14, you will get something around 56. And 140 into 28 is 3920. So you can imagine how much is a potassium, which is a big store or a get down of potassium intracellular. It's a big storehouse here. So that's why whenever there's a cell lysis, a tumor lysis, cell lysis, hemolysis, rhabdomyolysis, or even MIs or liver hepatic, uh, some, any cell lysis, the potassium just comes out. And that's why you get 
uh, hyperkalemia. Well, then you see at the intake, a normal potassium, normal day, we take anywhere between 60 to 100 milligrams per day. So this 60 to 100 milligrams per day comes in into the extracellular fluid. And because of the principle of homeostasis, if you take 100, 100 comes out. Nothing goes in, there might be a change, but it's maintained in equilibrium. Okay. Now look at this. As you can see, the urine almost accounts for 90% and the bowels account for eight to 10%. This is really essential to understand. So it's 90% comes from the kidneys, 10% comes from the bowels. When there's no urine, the bowels will go up to 50%. Okay, so still, if you're continuing to get a high potassium diet, if there's no urine, like in dialysis patient, the bowels will take care of it, but it won't be sufficient and the patient will be on higher and higher potassium levels. But what's here to understand is, the bowels do make up, try to make up, and they, their capacity goes very high to excrete the potassium. That's why if you get constipated in a dialysis patient, you will see hyperkalemia. So the rule of the thumb is make sure that if you're not dialyzing, you make sure that the patient is not constipated. We always, like I do PD, and we always tell that do not get constipated because that's one way of maintaining the PD good, but also taking care of the potassium, okay? Now, as you know, potassium shifts intracellular and extracellular, okay? So what are the things which put the potassium inside the cell and causes potassium levels to go low? So the potassium is pushed inside the cell from ECF to ICF by insulin, and I mentioned to you, the channel was sodium hydrogen antiporter. It allows the sodium to go in. It stimulates sodium potassium ATPase, three sodium out, two potassium in. And that's why the potassium will be shifted. The same way is the beta to acrine receptor agonist and alkalosis, okay? This is the basis of your shifting, okay? You use glucose insulin, you use the beta to agonist, you don't use bicarb because there's a problem with using the bicarb. Unless the patient is terminal, you may want to use it, but usually we don't use bicarb, okay? So these are the things which put the potassium in. What are the things which will pull the potassium out? Exactly the opposite of this. If you have got insulin deficiency, that means you have hyperglycemia, the beta-2 antagonists, which are the beta blockers, acid alkalosis pushes it in, acidosis pushes it, uh, pulls it out, if you've got increase in the osmolarity, if there's too much of osmo stuff here, the water from the cells will come out, dragging the potassium out, okay, will cause hypercalcemia, which will be commonly seen in patients with diabetes. For example, in patients with diabetes who come with a very high sugar, like 50 or 60, uh, or else like in the other units is along like 800 or 900, in that the potassium gets translocated out of the cell, okay? And then exercise, now exercise, the way potassium comes out of the exercise is the physiology is because exercise is supposed to cause uh, potassium coming out of the cells because the cell needs more blood supply. Potassium is supposed to be a vasodilatory effect. So you are not supposed to treat a potassium if you have done an exercise immediately because that potassium will be taken care of by the body immediately. Okay, now coming to renal handling of the potassium. As you can see in this diagram, the filtered load is almost 600 to 700 milligrams per day. 80% is absorbed in the proximal, 15 to 20% is reabsorbed here. And then potassium gets excreted. Now this is the place where the potassium fine tuning comes place, okay? This is the same place where sodium fine tuning comes place. Now remember a uh, ratio one is to 10 for many things in sodium and potassium. For potassium, we excrete almost 10%. See here, 8, 790, so it's almost 10%, but in sodium, we only excrete 1%, okay? And that's all because of the aldosterone, okay? So it's the this is the final part where the potassium secretion or fine modulation takes place. If you are asked about which drugs are acting on the 
causing high potassium, usually on the, this are on this side of the uh, nephron. Okay, so now coming to where and how. This is a thick ascending limb, and this is the collecting duct in the principal cell. In the thick ascending limb, this is the luminal side, and this is the basolateral the blood side, the capillary side. As you can see, this is our channel for the Lasix fresamide, sodium, potassium, two chloride anti uh, uh, co transport. Uh, transporter. Here you can see sodium, chloride and potassium comes in. Potassium comes out by the, this channel which is known as ROMK, rat, rat outer medullary potassium channel. Here the sodium is taken in, three sodium out, two potassium in, the potassium is gets recycled again. Okay. Now this is at our ascending loop of Henle, uh, thick ascending loop. Coming slightly distal in the collecting duct, we got this channel here, ENAC channel. Now ENAC channel takes the sodium in and potassium comes out. Very important to understand. This is the same channel, ENAC, which is stimulated or increased in production by the aldosterone. As you can see, aldosterone is here, which comes and stimulates the mineralocortical receptor it increases the inac channel, increases this channel uh, for the potassium, it's known as maxi K channel, and also stimulates the sodium potassium ATPase here. So now what you need to understand is sodium has to be here for the potassium to come out. Okay, so again I repeat, sodium has to be here for the potassium to come out. If there's no sodium, potassium will not come out, okay? So now, what does that mean? Why am I trying to tell you this? Because if the patient is having an intravascular depleted state, like post-diuretic, like um, have, there's no sodium reaching here, potassium will be retained. Potassium, you will see that patient is dry and has hyperkalemia. That's why you need the sodium to be coming in here. That's one thing. Second thing is this channel is really important for the potassium to come out, the ENAC channel. Now ENAC, you get certain drugs which act on the ENAC channel. This ENAC channel is blocked by triamterine and amyloride. Those are known as the classical potassium sparing uh, diuretics, but also certain antibiotics, which is septra. The trimethoprim, remember the third question, how did the potassium go up? It's because the trimethoprim moiety of the co trimoxazole comes and sits here and it blocks this channel. It deforms it, it does not allow it to function. Because of that, the sodium is not exchanged, the potassium is, does not come out. And that's why you get hyperkalemia in a patient who is on septra. Okay, so that's really essential to understand that this way, this place, you need sodium here. So this also means if you need a sodium here to reach and if what you can do is you can block the sodium absorption from here by giving Lasix and use a line. So you can allow more sodium to come on this side for the potassium to come out here. So that's the basis of why you give saline plus Lasix. That is giving salt with Lasix so for the potassium to come out either in its own way, it may not act as much. Means if you give only Lasix or only saline, obviously don't give saline if the patient is having pulmonary edema, but if the patient is dry and you, you think the patient is, can handle uh, fluid, you have to use saline plus Lasix. Always rem, uh, we have to do that. So the potassium will come out. What we need to know and understand is there has to be a luminal flow rate that means there has to be some GFR. You can't uh, do in an anuric patient. There has to be distal de sodium delivery. That means the sodium has to be delivered. That's why I'm saying saline. This also needs aldosterone or the medications which are causing the blocking of the aldosterone. So we may have to like RAS blockers or any, uh, like spinal lactone. If those are on board, we have to stop them. 
the potassium excretion also depends on how much potassium is there and the extracellular pH is obviously because of the acidosis pulls out the more potassium. Acidosis also causes inhibition of a machinery here in which the bicarb is not generated. As you know, like acidosis indicates acidosis. Uh, acidosis causes hyperkalemia, hyperkalemia causes acidosis. So now coming to again the kidneys, when do you start getting this hyperkalemia? Usually after stage four, stage four like EGFR less than 30 and in stage three, if you have diabetes, because as you know, diabetics have hyperanemic, hypoaldosterone state. So there's a problem with the aldosterone axis. So you start getting high potassiums. Like you start on uh, ramipril 2.5 and the patient's EGFR is like 35 and the potassium starts with like 5.3, 5.4. You know that this is happening now. Or else if you've got a tubular interstitial disease or the patient is on drugs increasing the potassium. Now, what are the drugs that increase the potassium? It's a long list, but actually very easy for a nephrologist to remember. And it's uh, here. Obviously potassium containing drugs, beta blockers, I'm explaining you that, ACE inhibitors, which are going to block the aldosterone because of the renin angiotensin and aldosterone system. ARB is the same, DRI is the same, heparin. Now, when you have a patient on heparin, IV heparin, not the subcutaneous heparin, but IV heparin, you, if you start, if you are noted that a patient who's on IV heparin, after two or three days, this potassium starts going up. The reason is because heparin does not allow aldosterone to get secreted out or get synthesized. So the patient in this, is in a state of hypoaldosteronism. That's why the potassium goes up, okay? Then you've got aldosterone receptor antagonist, which are spanlactins, epilirinol, potassium sparing diuretics, which is amyloid and trimetering, which act on the inactional, NSAIDs and COX-2 inhibitors, digitalis and all the calcium inhibitors, which are cyclosporin and tachodons. Now, this is a slide from up to date, okay? So what are the major causes of hyperkalemia? So basically what they have divided into two, increased potassium release from the cells, that is a shift or decreased urine output. Let's concentrate on the decreased urine output, uh, decreased urinary uh, potassium. So you got reduced aldosterone, again, aldosterone problem, and this is what reduce distal sodium or water delivery, effect water blood volume is depletion, acute chronic disease, or selective impairment of potassium excretion, Gordon syndrome, which I'll be coming to, or if you got a conduit in which the potassium will be absorbed or the chloride will be absorbed causing acidosis. So it's basically not that difficult at all if you see the renal issues. It's pretty simple. If you have got less GFR, less volume, or there's an aldosterone problem. The other things, are a shift. And those are the ones that usually come when you are on outpatient. These are the things that you I will look, look for. One is pseudohyperkalemia. We'll be talking about that. Metabolic acidosis. I mean, told you how it causes the potassium shift, insulin deficiency, increased tissue catabolism, beta blockers, exercise. Now, a word about hyperkalemic periodic paralysis. So what is hyperkalemic periodic paralysis? It is very rarely seen, not commonly seen, but I thought that I should include this because it's related with high potassium. You get an abnormal gene, SCN4A, and it's a channelopathy because of the sodium. What happens is this sodium channel is mutated and it allows the potassium, sodium to go in, 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 in. The muscle gets super excited and then potassium comes out. That's the reason why you see hyperkalemia. It's not potassium which is causing the muscle weakness. It's the sodium which causes goes inside the cell and causes the hyperkalemia. And you get episodes of weakness or fatigue when the patient has got cold or exercise or fasting and injection of potassium and the potassium levels can be high or normal. Then you get paraparesis. What you do is prevention is by thiazides. You know, it's basically the same stuff that you do for any hyperkalemic uh, patient. You give diuretics or you get inhaled beta agonist, carbon and, and, and anhydrous inhibitors, which is for the proximal tubular blockage of the potassium absorption. Coming back to the same list, then we have got ditch, blood transfusion, succinylcholine, arginine, and activities of ATP dependent potassium channels, which are these medications that we went, uh, we had done earlier. So it's not a big list and if you, have a system of understanding where the potassium is coming from, it's pretty easy.
to see where the uh, and then tackle it. A word about what is wind kinase pathway. So as you know, uh, so as the genetic studies have been coming off lately with uh, more and more details, uh, we got into this known as wind kinase WNK. It means with no lysine. The K stands for lysine, amino acid lysine. So in those proteins in which uh, the potassium, uh, there are uh, different WNK proteins out of which four and one get affected in the mutations. What happens in that is it starts allowing the, the, the sodium is retained by the distal tubules. And because of that, there's a hypertension. And it, one of the other things which this disease does is also inhibits the potassium secreted from the ROMK channel causes hyperkalemia. So you get something known as pseudo hypoaldosteronism. Why it is known as hypoaldosteronism? Because there's a potassium is up. So it, people think it is probably low aldosterone. But if the patient is hypoaldosteronism, the patient's blood pressure should be low, but this is high. So this is known as pseudo hypoaldosteronism type two. This is known as Gordon's syndrome, okay? So just a word about uh, many kinase pathways for potassium and hypertension. Any questions so far? Uh, I can't open up the chat. Is there anything in the chat? Okay. I'm going ahead. So now, coming to the clinical manifestations. The clinical manifestations are pretty simple. There are only three. One is cardiac. As we all know, the ECG changes. Okay. Now, there are a few things in the ECG changes that you should be aware of is the tall peak T waves is here. The way that you remember this is you can get tall peak T waves in sub, uh, my, uh, sub endocardial infarction and everything, but this ST segment elevation is not supposed to be a part of the tall peak T waves, okay? Second thing is this peak T waves are very tented and it's like very symmetrical. So they're isosymmetric. If you put a mirror in between, this side is same as this side, okay? So if you get uh, asymmetrical T wave, you don't think of potassium, but you have to look into that. Okay. Okay. Then what happens is then you get widened PR, widened QRS, peak T waves, and then all of them merge together to form a loss of P waves so any certain pattern. Okay. What levels does it happen? Please do not think of the levels. Things can be bad with a potassium level of 5.7 things can be pretty normal with a potassium level of nine. So there is no whatsoever correlation with the level of potassium and the T wave uh, ECG changes. If you have ECG changes, be careful. Put the patient on a cardiac monitor and put, immediately give him calcium gluconate IV because that's essential. Otherwise the patient will go in fatal arrhythmias in which nothing works. That's why before it, that happens, make sure that the calcium is given. Okay. Coming to the muscular weakness, the skeletal muscles, and it's sort of an ascending weakness, no sensory involvement. So it mimics GBS kind of a picture, okay, J-Berry, in which sphincters and cranial nerves are intact. The weakness is quite, it will happen anything above a level of like eight, nine, but the diaphragmatic weakness is what we care about. It's pretty rare, but can happen. The last thing is paralytic alias. A paralytic alias, as you know, is classical with hypokalemia, post-op status, but can also happen with hyperkalemia. When you have paralytic alias, the colon is shut down, poop doesn't come out, it further precipitates hyperkalemia. So hyperkalemia causing hyperkalemia again from the GI tract. Now coming to the ECG back, I told you about this ECG changes, but there is something also known as the hyperkalemic Brugada sign, okay? As you know, the Brugada syndrome in which you have got the ST elevation here, which would look like a MI, but this is the patient is asymptomatic and this is a Brugada sign, which is type one and type two. And you can get similar features in potassium as well. And this has been well known. So hyperkalemic Brugada sign, so don't, forget to check the electrolytes whenever you have any ECG changes, okay? 
Okay. Now coming to the evaluation of hyperkalemia. It's uh, I've taken this from comprehensive clinical nephrology because I find this very easy. If you see there are, there are ECG changes, yes, just treat it. No, rule out a pseudo hyperkalemia. And I'll tell you what a pseudo hyperkalemia means. If if it is pseudo hyperkalemia, you don't have to do anything. If it is not a pseudo hyperkalemia, that means it's a true hyperkalemia. Assess what are the causes. History of dietary intake, potassium intake is more. You do dietary counseling. Does the patient have an obstruction on the ultrasound? Or you feel the bladder, put in a Foley's catheter or a bladder scan, treat it. Is the patient having metabolic acidosis? Then treat the metabolic acidosis. Does the patient have high osmolarity because of non urea like glucose? Treat that. Is the patient on any medications? Stop that. Is the patient CKD? Then you know what to do. By the way, I didn't tell you, but uh, one of the big names in potassium, Dr. Kamil Kamil, always teaches that when your patient has a true hyperkalemia, there's always some element of metabolic acidosis present. Okay, so that's why it's really important to understand, look at the bicarb as well when the patient has high potassium. It will tell you whether this is true or not true. So what is pseudo hyperkalemia? So pseudo hyperkalemia means the potassium is elevated in the blood, which is an artifact. Now this can be within the body or outside the body. Okay, so when do you get from inside the body? If the patient as you know, when we tie the tunica or we ask someone to hold the hand to make the veins prominent, and then we ask the patient to clench the wrist or do flexion and extension of the arm uh, for the elbow to make the veins prominent, that time the potassium gets squeezed out from the muscles and then it's very highly concentrated into the anterior cubital vein and that's you draw the blood and then you see that the potassium is up. The bicarb will be normal there. What you do in this kind of situation is actually you have to show that the potassium is not elevated when you do, uh, either you do a VBG when you send a heparin sample uh, or else what you can also do is, sorry, that's for the other way, uh, the other uh, hyper, pseudo hyperkalemia. What you do is basically, if you have hold the hand tight or you have tied a tunique, release the tunique, I mean, uh, after you uh, insert the needle, wait for two minutes, the release the tunica, wait for two minutes, and then aspirate the blood after two minutes so that the potassium is already, uh, the circulation is re-established and the potassium content, high content of the blood is uh, not there. The other uh, issues of pseudo hyperkalemia is if you have got very high blood cells, and once they, these cells come out of the body, like high WBCs, RBCs of platelets, they get lysed because they're high, and then the potassium will come out and that causes pseudo hyperkalemia. In that situation, what you do is you send a heparin sample or an ABG or a VBG in which the, uh, they, the cells are not allowed to uh, uh, lyse and then you can get a potassium value which is true. And what you show is that you show that uh, the potassium value is more than 0.3 higher than the simultaneous plasma sample. Okay, So pseudo hyperkalemia will not come with any high uh, ECG changes and it's not some, uh, something to be treated, but we always try to get this. I usually look at the glucose levels. I usually look at the cell level, uh, the cells lines. And thirdly, is I, I ask the patient, when did, how was the blood collected for pseudo hyperkalemia? I did pick up two or three times in my outpatient of uh, pseudo hyperkalemia, and the potassium from 5.7, 5.6 has always been like 4.8, 4.9. So that's why it was proven that this was pseudo hyperkalemia. Okay, coming to how do you evaluate for a renal excretion of potassium? The thing is, you can use pot urine potassium creatinine ratio, but all the studies have been used for hypokalemia. And they say that less than 2.5, if you have hypokalemia and less than 2.5, that means the creatinine is not a problem. Uh, the kidneys are not a problem, but you cannot use, uh, you don't use it here. Till almost a decade back, we used something known as transtubular potassium gradient, but nowadays we are not using it because I think what happened was they made an assumption that urea was not recycled. When the urea was, when they put in the urea in the factor, it didn't, it was not correct. So that's why they removed the transferable potassium gradient. Otherwise you can, ex what you can do is a 24 urine potassium excretion. Like if the patient has taken 100 and he puts out like 100, 
that means you know that the potassium is uh, excreted totally. But this is not something that we do. So if you want to evaluate for renal excretion of potassium, there's not a single test actually you can do for this. Okay, coming for the treatment. So the treatment of hyperkalemia, you always ask first question, is this an emergency or is this dangerous? Is this like going to kill the patient immediately or else it can wait for six to 12 hours or else whether it's known, uh, you need to do it as an outpatient, okay? So the first thing is you always look, see if the patient has a weakness of paralysis or cardiac conduction abnormalities, ECG abnormalities, or else if the patient has rhabdomyolysis because the rhabdomyolysis that means the potassium will go up very fast, very soon. The CK is coming down to block the kidney. So the urine output is going to drop in some time. So before that happens, it ha you have to treat it as hyperkalemia. Okay. When do you wait for some time, like six to 12 hours? This is the time when you want to delay uh, definitive th therapy. So if a dialysis patient who has missed his dialysis, and he's out of his, like, he, he was, he has dialysis like uh, on Monday and he comes on Wednesday. Instead of in the morning shift, he comes in the afternoon shift and you don't have someone to dialysis, you can wait, you can buy some time, okay? Or else the patient has a marginal kidney function or marginal urine output, and you know that this patient is not going to respond to your Lasix and saline, then you better treat. Or sometimes, as you know, our colleagues in surgery and anesthesia call us the night before because the potassium was 6.1. Can you make the patient fit for surgery tomorrow and bring the potassium down? That's the time when you want to do this kind of stuff. And when you treat an outpatient, the outpatient is when you, it's potassium is 5.6, 5.7 or something, or you know that ramipril was started, it doesn't have to be taken care of immediately. So what is a hyperkalemic emergency? Anyone, everyone has its own standard. Someone will say 5.5 and above, someone will say 6 and above, someone will say 6.5 and above. One of the books mentioned 7 and above. Usually for me, it's 6.5. Each one of your own uh, comfort level, what you want to treat as a hyperkalemic emergency. But after 6.5, I really get uncomfortable. What you should be doing is make sure that a patient is in the monitor setting, attach a cardiac monitor, at least get an ECG, push, keep the crash card ready in case if the patient needs to be, uh, if the patient goes in VFib, VTAC, and get ECG stand. Always stabilize the cardiac membrane first, but make sure that the patient is not on ditch. Okay, if the patient is on digoxin and you're giving calcium, it can precipitate digitalis toxicity. Also, if the patient's digitalis levels are high, digoxin levels are high and you give calcium, it will stop the heart. So make sure that the patient is not on digoxin. A small thing just to know. How do you establish the cardiac membrane? Is you give calcium gluconate, one gram IV over two to three minutes or calcium chloride through central line. Now, the most commonly done is calcium gluconate, not calcium chloride. Calcium gluconate is non-ionized, but calcium chloride is fully ionized. If this gets outside the vein, it causes necrosis. This, if it gets outside the vein, it uh, doesn't cause much necrosis. However, for, uh, for weight by weight, this is very pot twice as potent as calcium gluconate. Usually we don't use calcium chloride, but we use calcium gluconate. The other thing that you should be aware of, don't try to mix calcium with bicarbonate because the patient is having acidosis. Don't do it because it will precipitate to form calcium carbonate and that's not what we want to do. The second thing that we do is shifting the potassium intracellular by giving glucose. Now the first you give glucose, don't give insulin first. The reason is because if you lose an IV access, the patient will have hypoglycemia. Now you give 50 ml, 50% dextrose. And in here on the, uh, in Canada, we have to do it on the floor, on the ward, except in the IC or the ER where the nurses will do it. And then you give insulin, 10 units of regular insulin, this pro aspart is also fine, but if you get IV, it should be good enough, okay? And then you should monitor the glucose levels every 15 to 30 minutes. Now, when does the hypoglycemia happen? The hypoglycemia can happen within 15 minutes to up to 10 hours but usually will happen between in first two hours, it's around two hours, okay? So make sure that you're monitoring the glucose levels. Now, certain books will mention, you can use 20 units, but and you 100 ml, but 
invariably my I have done that like four or five times and try to get the maximum benefit of getting a potassium in, but it causes hypoglycemia. That's why I do it 50 ml, 50% dextrose with 10 units of regular insulin. With this, how much insulin, with this, how much potassium goes down? It goes down by 0.6 to 1, 1.2. And then the action is pretty fast. You may have to repeat it after every uh, six hours or so. Okay. Then the second, then the second agent that you can use is beta agonist, which is salbutamol inhalation. This is the same thing, well, which we use for our uh, asthma. But the doses are like 50, 30 to 50 times more than what you need for asthma. So the patients start getting tremors and uh, tachycardia. Okay, so be careful about this asthma cell uh, tumor. And you can repeat it if needed. Then coming to, once you have shifted the cells, then you come to the kidneys for removal. Okay. Now, when the kidneys, you, the kidneys will work only when there's a urine output. Okay, so there has to be a GFR. So, and again, back to the, principles, there should be some flow to the distal uh, convoluted tubule. So you have to give IV fluids and there has to be sodium. So you have to give saline. There's no point in giving uh, half normal or D5W here. Okay? And you bolus a liter in one to two hours. Obviously don't give it to the patient is volume overloaded or he's on oxygen. You have to be careful and give Lasix dose. Now Lasix dose is like, it depends on whether the patient has, was on Lasix or not. If you think that the patient was not on Lasix, give 40 mg IV. If you think the patient was on Lasix, just give 100 mg or something, whatever you want is your comfort zone. But don't try to, don't be shy to give 10, 10 mg, 20 mg because you really want the potassium to go out. So don't shy, just give the dose. Monitor the blood pressure. If the patient's blood pressure goes down because of overdiagnosis, just to give the saline back. That's what I would suggest. Always for the potassium to come up from the kidneys, ensure three things. There is a renal function, UIV fluids, if the patient is dry and the pre-renal and obstruction is ruled out. Very important, okay? Make sure that there's a creatinine is there, means uh, there's some urine output, give fluids and make sure that obstruction is ruled out. In the GI ways, what are the ways in which the GI is removed? It's remember it's the volume of the feces, no matter how. So you make the patient poop out. You have to make the patient poop out maximum. And then you've got the exchange reasons. We have got two new ones, pateromer, which is 8.4 grams and zirconium, 10 grams, three times a day for 48 hours and then daily, okay? There's a third one, which is our old timer, which is known as cake slit. Now, nowadays, because of the concerns of bowel necrosis, we don't use it. But believe me, this is the maximally used uh, potassium binder, but we don't, we're not supposed to use it now. We'll use it, uh, but be careful if you suspect obstruction, constipation of paralytic ileus, ulcerative colitis, or prostate deficiency, don't use this cake slate, okay? And then our last thing is dialysis. Now, dialysis for hyperkalemia, it's usually around 25 to 50 milligrams. Hemodialysis is 25 to 50 milligrams per hour. It depends on the hemodialysis parameters. And you'll always get a potassium rebound after HD session. That's why you may need to have a, a gain of potassium. Uh, you may need to have another session of dialysis after four hours. So just measure the potassium after that. What happens is if you have shifted the potassium before the dialysis, what happens is the potassium goes from the extracellular to the intracellular, and it stays there for four hours, and then you're dialyzing the extracellular with low potassium, and then after a few hours, when the intracellular potassium starts coming out, you'll get a rebound potassium. The other thing is also when you have a high sodium bath, there's a shift and potassium goes inside the cell, and that's why it will allow, it will be rebounded back after a hemodialysis session. What about PD? If the patient has peritoneal dialysis, and has hyperkalemia, you don't have to shift to HD, okay? That's not something what we do here. What we do is we'll just treat with the rapid exchanges, okay? So what we'll do is we'll do two hour exchanges, rapid for 12 hours and repeat the potassium and you LASIKs if there is a residual renal function, okay? 
So in the concentration of the glucose, you don't have to use 4.25. You can use 1.5%, 2.5% or 4.25% because remember it's the, the PD solutions don't have the potassium in it. You may get some more clearance by the convection of the ultrafiltration, but that's not much. What you need is a rapid exchanges for the potassium to come out. And the specific therapies, the specific therapies are either you give when, if the patient is ditch toxicity, you deject and specific binding antibody, uh, the antibodies, reduce the obstruction and stop the potassium supplements or drugs. Now, this is what you uh, take home message should be like, uh, like if you know the calcium, the onset of duration is one to three minutes, duration is 30 to 60 minutes. This means that you may have to repeat it for 60 minutes. Insulin is onset is 30 minutes. You may have to repeat it for six hours. Aterium and zirconium. Zirconium, I'll show you in the next slide, is being really fast in putting the potassium out of the, uh, in one to two hours itself. Okay. And hemodialysis is very immediate. So the chronic management would be to stop the potassium drug, review the RAS blockers or the RAS blockers with spinal lactone. Give them basically medications in the drug review. If the patient has high potassium intake in the diet, stop the diet uh, with high potassium. If you're going to use diuretics, use a long acting diathylates, which is like fluoroxylidone or endopamide. Medications is again the potassium binders. You can use fludrocortisone. I didn't touch on fludrocortisone because it's not something that we should be looking for, for unless the patient is having uh, low blood pressures. The problem with fluorocortisone is it will cause sodium retention, edema can pursue a heart failure. That's why I don't want to use it. And bicarb is only if the patient has acidosis. Like if the bicarb is 18 on the outpatient, you may want to use it. So now coming to this two new medications, Petiromer, it binds to potassium in the colon. And I'm going to show you this trial, which is Amethyst DN trial in which uh, they had 306 diabetic patients. And what they did was they had two arms, mild potassium hyperkalemia and moderate hyperkalemia. Potassium mild was 5.1 to 5.5, and the moderate was 5.6 to 5.9. And as you can see, the potassium levels came down immediately on day one, uh, day three. And they were able to maintain this till week uh, 52. So this is the week. And once they stopped, the potassium came back again. So this was showing that how patiromer is able to maintain the potassium below five. Now these patients were not on dialysis and they were on RAS blockers. So they, the, the study design was to allow the patients to take RAS blockers or spinal lactone. This was the other study, which was the open HK study, which also showed that the potassium from 5.8, 5.4 came down. Now this again, remember my friends, these are from outpatient. Okay. And again, uh, some uh, 243 patients, and they had uh, uh, similar findings. Uh, whether it's mild hyperkalemia or moderate hyperkalemia, the potassium will come down, and they're allowed to use RAS blockers. Once you stop the patiromer, the potassium will come back. But if you are continued on patiromer, the increase of hyperkalemia is much less as compared to the placebo. So this was a randomized control trial in which pateromer was continued and as compared to placebo. Coming to sodium zirconium, this is known as localma. Now what, is, what I want you to see guys is like, again, these are with mild to moderate hyperkalemia and look at the time hours. Once you start giving, a, you give them medication, the potassium rapidly drops down to almost within four hours. So this is what it is, okay? So that's why, you can use this sodium zirconium cyclosilate. I'm not sure whether it's available in Africa or not. I'm, I think it is available. And it is, you are able to dodge the dialysis then, like if you have a failed fistula or a thrombus clot or a line exchange. Okay? And what has been shown, shown is that you are able to give it for at least four weeks that the potassium is maintained. Now, what about the dialysis patient? So again, this was a dialysis patient. This was a randomized control trial in which uh, there was a significant drop in potassium for the patients who were on dialysis and in the long uh, two days in between. 
and they were able to keep the potassium below five for the dialysis patient. And this was 41.2% versus 1%. And they were maintained on the a dose of 10 grams uh, two times a day or three times a day. I, I forget to. So again, this zirconium, uh, sodium zirconium cyclosilicate can be used in dialysis patients too. So coming to the last slide, always remember the big picture, emergent management versus the chronic management for potassium excretion from the kidneys, have the GFR, means the urine should be there. There should be sodium at the distal tubule. Make sure that the volume patient is volume replete. There are new potassium binders, pateromer and cyclosilate uh, and zirconium. And don't forget about a diet and drugs. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Kusha. It was a nice and extensive presentation on hyperkalemia. So we will start with the question from the chat. And if anyone wants to ask anything, they can raise their hand, then we'll give them a chance to talk. So I'll take over from where you left. Dr. Bazhar is asking, what is your take on erythropoietin causing hyperkalemia? Uh, we don't honestly think of erythropoietin causes hyperkalemia. Uh, usually, if at all, there should be erythropoiesis, uh, should be taking much of potassium, but I'm not, uh, well, uh, I don't know anything about erythropoietin causes hyperkalemia. Uh, there may be case reports, but not much. I'm not that much aware of. We don't usually think of erythropoietin causing uh, hyperkalemia, or else I, I probably don't know. Okay, thank you. Another question from Dominic. What is the cutoff time to think of prolonged tonicate for diagnosis of pseudo hyperkalemia? So what they mentioned is like, once you put in the needle and if you have put in the tonicate, release the tonicate, don't aspirate the blood. Keep the needle inside, wait for two minutes. So that will allow the blood to come in and go back. And it's a new circulation has come up and then aspirate the blood. So you should wait for two minutes, two to three minutes. Okay, thank you. We have a comment from Dr. Mazhao saying that sending the blood sample on ice can mediate the effect of cell lysis and pseudohyperkalemia in patient with hematologic malignancy. Okay, That's another good. question. I'm not doing. Another question from Marie is asking, any concern if IV insulin is mixed with glucose 50%? Uh, never thought of that. <laughs> wow. Well, uh, why would you mix the two together? Well, uh, there should not be any issues because both of them are going inside. And I don't think insulin has anything to do with the glucose uh, like, uh, like outside the in vivo. But I may be wrong. I, I, this is just a guesswork. Yeah. I think also Mary was saying insulin supplement with dextrose. And again, Dr. Mazar is saying patorima and uh, sodium zirconium cyclosyphase are not available or they are okay. too expensive. In that case, can we use chiaxylate, especially yes. in AB3 patients? True. I know that uh, there's, I was not aware of whether it's available or not. But cakes, I believe me, cake slate is with problems, but it is the most widely used. So till you get the uh, sodium, uh, zirconium, cyclosilicate or patiromon, I think be careful about uh, using uh, cake slate. Don't use it if the patient is suspected to have any bowel pathologies, any, like you suspect like patient is coming vomiting or like you see bowel distension, like abnormal distension, don't use it because it will cause bowel necrosis. We have lost patients here once or twice, and it's because of the cake slit. The same discussion, I think, is going on from Dr. Lloyd. He's asking, cake slit not suggested for today chronic use. What would you suggest? A low potassium diet. And it's not that I'm saying don't use it. You can use it, but with careful. The, see, it's more, it's the amount of poop, the bowel movements, that is uh, the feces that really matter. It's not the specific uh, medication, okay? So make sure that it's not constipated, that less diet, uh, the less potassium in the diet. Use diuretics if you need to. And you can use cakes with it, but use it with water. 
uh, traditionally what used to happen was they used to say use cakes with uh, sorbitol. A sorbitol causes focal dehydration at the place where it is impacted and that causes the more, uh, more ball necrosis. So that's why you can use it with water, but be careful. Okay. Then Aoko Rose is asking, kindly explain the proper way for potassium binding. And also uh, asking, do we give 50% dextrose as a bolus, then give 10 international units of soluble insulin and infuse the calcium gluconate slowly? Or how do we go about it? What is the correct procedure? Okay, so let's start with the calcium. So calcium is one gram of 10%. So you'll have to give one uh, and 10% uh, of that uh, solution calcium gluconate. Give it over two to three minutes. When I was a resident in India, I used to do it IV myself, but monitoring on the pulse. Or else you can put it that uh, in 100 ml or 50 ml saline and run it over three to four, uh, five to six minutes. Regarding the insulin, you don't have to put it in anything, just push it insulin, but make sure that you push the glucose inside first. And always glucose insulin has, to, you don't, uh, give it, you have to push the glucose first. Uh, it's like pushing, not like a uh, infusion. Okay. So pu push the glucose, push the insulin, because you are not going to wait there for some uh, slowly, because insulin action, if it starts and you don't have the glucose on board, you can have neuroglycopenia, which is not correct. Thank you. Prosper was also uh, talking about the binders, which we have already discussed. And Dominic also was trying to explain about uh, calcium gluconate. Now another question from MN. What would you explain hypokalemia instead of hyperkalemia in a patient with CKD stage four, EGFR 18? So remember there can be potassium wasting nephropathies. There can be intubular interstitial diseases. Uh, RTA type, uh, RTAs can be also there. They can cause hypokalemia. If you've got too much of diuretics on board, or the patient is like uh, having lots of uh, diarrheas that can cause hypokalemia too. There's also something known as hypokalemic nephropathy in which you will get renal failure with hypokalemia because as a cause of uh, renal failure. So those are many things which can cause hypokalemia in stage four. Thank you. Ahmed, um, Ahmed is asking, is sodium bicarbonate has a role in the management? No, it's only out, an outpatient. Don't try to use it as an in uh, like an emergency, emergency. You want to use it if the patient is pH is less, less than 7.1, go ahead and use it. But uh, otherwise it has no role in whatsoever for hyperkalemia. Okay. But uh, outpatient, you should give oral bicarb because that's good for the uh, renal function. Okay, Dorothy um, is asking, what is the frequency of monitoring potassium during management? Don't do it every less than six hours, do it after six hours. Otherwise you're unnecessarily going to treat it again and again. Okay, thank you. And Mazha again is coming up. Um, following up on my question, Epo, there are apparently uh, RCTs on this from the 90s. This suggests something related to increase hematocrit with Epo that has an effect of reduced dialyzability of potassium. I'm un unsure if the dialyzers oh, are using so what happens is, now I get it. If you have increased hematocrit, the clearance by dialyzer is less because there's less amount of fluid. There's more of shifting towards intracellular. Is that what you're trying to tell me? Um, it's possible because that's when you dialyze with a hemoglobin of say 150, as compared to a hemoglobin of 50, there's a two different ways the clearance will be there. The clearance is much less when the high hemoglobin. That's why. Okay. Dr. Mazhar, I think you are okay. Or do you want maybe to say something? Uh, Frida, uh, yeah. I have a, one talk at, uh, I have to go, sorry, I have to end the talk. Sorry. Sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. So maybe we can shorten. I think we are finished with the chat. Um, just Omari, can you speak like 20 seconds and then we end uh, the uh, talk? Thank you very much, uh, Kusha, for a nice and uh, elaborate presentation. I, I was wondering, uh, would you advise to give insulin for a non-diabetic uh, individual without supplementing 
uh, glucose, that, that, that's one of my questions. My second question would, would is about, we have, we have seen a number of uh, alternatives in the management of hyperkalemia. Is there a well-defined algorithm to follow that can eventually lead uh, to a, a well-managed uh, uh, patient? That, because you see there's binders, there's insulin, there's dialysis, there's a, a number of issues. Any kind of uh, algorithm so far? Well, I got your first question. I couldn't get the uh, second question, but I'll tell you about the first question. So the question was whether you would like to give insulin for a non-diabetic patient. And yeah, the, without supplementing with the glucose. So the risk factors for hypoglycemia is a young patient, non-diabetic, but especially if they're on dialysis. Okay. So yes, you do want to give glucose and insulin, just monitor the glucose because it's not the glucose, it's the insulin that we need, okay, for putting the potassium inside. Now, glucose, we do it because it's an effect of the insulin that we will have a hypoglycemia. <laughs> so you will need uh, glucose and insulin both. And yes, we do it. But again, the risk factor is young, dialysis patients who are non-diabetic. The And then you monitor the glucose levels. Any kind of algorithm, algorithm that summarizes a, a number of how to start with it, to follow, and uh, eventually what to do, because yeah. there are a lot of things there. Yes. Yes, so I think we'll send the presentation of Dr. Tusha to everybody, and then you can I'll, see I'll send, What I'll do is I'll send the uh, PowerPoint presentation, and I'll also send my email. In case if you, friends, if you have any questions, please contact me. Yes, yes. Thank you, Tusha. Uh, I will send uh, your email out to people. They will contact you directly. Absolutely. And just your presentation as well. All your presentation, I will send it out. And uh, I apologize I have... that I have to leave early because I have another presentation which was supposed to start at 12. Sorry, I'm I sorry. sorry. <laughs> and thank you, thank so you Tusha. Thank, thank you, you, Frida. Thank you, Tusha. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Okay, so I think we can end now and have a good day. Have a nice weekend. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye. bye.